Uh, my name is Huma and uh, I'm a fifth year um, emergency medicine resident at McGill University. Sure, my name is uh, Thalit Chukhtai. I'm a surgeon at the Montreal General Hospital. Hi, so I'm uh, Maria. I'm a general surgery resident at McGill in my first year. So at the Montreal General, uh, I'm part of the Department of Surgery. So I'm a surgeon that's part of the trauma surgery team. Uh, so that means I'm, you know, working with residents and it's a teaching hospital. So I'm a surgeon, I operate, I also see patients in consultation, um, I do clinics, and uh, we work with residents and we teach them. These are residents that are in training to become surgeons. So at the same time as treating patients and working, we're also teaching other, other students and residents that are trying to become surgeons. We work eight hour shifts, uh, so a full, full um, if I'm working full time, it'll be 12 shifts, 12 eight hour shifts a month that you'll work. Um, and that'll be day shifts, you can do evening shifts, you can do overnights. Um, and each shift will also pay differently as well. So day shift will be, you'll pay less, evening you'll get paid more, night shifts will get paid more obviously. Nobody wants to do evenings, even less people want to do nights. Um, so making a sense that you'll get paid more as well. Um, and uh, it's nice because you can make your, you can adjust your schedule, right? So if I have a dentist appointment, my dentist, I should have become a dentist. My dentist works <laughs> Monday to Friday, <laughs> eight to twelve, <laughs> oh, wow. uh, or you know, I'm like ridiculous hours. So for the average person, you know, you have to take a half a day off work to go see your dentist. I don't have to take time off of work. I can just make sure that I don't work that morning. I can see my dentist at eight o'clock, and I didn't miss any work. Uh, or if I want to go to the mall when it's not crowded, I can go on a Tuesday morning because I'm not working Tuesday morning. Um, so it works out from that perspective. Um, you know, for my sister, she's. She's also uh, an emergency physician and she has kids and what works out for her is that you know, she can take her kids to school if she wants or she can attend um, her, um, you know, um, activities or participate uh, and volunteer at her child's school during the daytime if she wants, once in a while, uh, because she has that option because her schedule is flexible. Uh, whereas, you know, the downside of a nine to five, Monday to Friday 9 to 5 job is that you can't necessarily do that unless you specifically ask for time off of work. So, for example, I'm doing my trauma rotation right now. So, I uh, our day generally starts at about 6 a.m. when we start rounding on the patients. That means every patient that's admitted to the hospital, we have to make sure that he, you know what happened overnight, uh, what happened the day before, what is the plan for the day. Um, so, we start rounding at 6 a.m. We look at all the patients, and then we uh, basically round with the staff to make sure that they're okay with our plan for the day. Usually, there's a couple of people on the team. So there's a, the medical students, there's a resident, and there's different levels of residents. So for example, I'm an R1, so that means I'm the first level of residents, and then there's R2s, R3s, R4s. So we review the plan first with our senior residents, and then we review with the staff all together. Generally, we round with the staff at about 9 a.m., and then we have a clear plan for every patient for the day, and then during the day we continue on doing whatever we decided in the morning. Um, What's special, a bit special about trauma is that usually we'll have what's called these activations. So if there are patients who've had traumas, then we have to go see them right away because usually they need urgent care. So they're the ones that we go and see. You know, we have the pay, pay, pagers that beep and then we go and see them in the emergency department. And if there's anything that needs to be operated on, then we go do that. If they need to go to the, to the scan to get more imaging, to see what's going on, then we go with them for that. And then again, we always review with our staff and we make a plan. So, tough work hours, obviously. Um, basically, my day will start anywhere between, you know, 7 and 9 o'clock, depending on what I'm doing. On days that I'm doing surgery, usually surgery starts around 7.30. So, I'm at the hospital by 7, 7.15. And the, the day of operations ends in the late afternoon, in the evening. And then I may have a few patients to see. And so, it's kind of like a 12-hour day. Uh, the days, so some days I'm on call, so all surgeons take their turn of being on call at night in case there's an emergency in the specialty that they do. So every night there's a neurosurgeon on call, there's a you know, thoracic surgeon on call, there's a you know, stomach surgeon, on, abdominal surgeon on call, so there's all these different people on call, so we take our turns. If I'm on call, that means I can get called any time that night and I'd have to go into an emergency surgery. So trauma, obviously, I take my turn on trauma call. Uh, and then, then there's other days where I do clinics, and I you know may start at nine o'clock and finish at four. And again, if I'm not on call, that's pretty much the the end of my day. So it's very very variable. 
Uh, I think that's the most difficult part is that it's very, very uh, you know, unpredictable. So if you're on call, you have no idea what's going to happen. Um, and then, you know, so usually about 10 to 12 hour days are usual. Uh, but you may get, you may be operating all night after that. So it could turn into a 20 hour, 24 hour sort of thing. And if the next day you have a clinic, then it's going to turn into a 30, 36 hour stint. So it's very hard to say exactly the hour. So it's very unpredictable. Our day ends at about uh, 6 p.m. And uh, that's about it. For CJEP, uh, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, so I, I did an undergraduate degree. I did a bachelor, a general bachelor of arts and science, and I did in, in many things, economics, math, but I also did a lot of the prerequisites for medical school, so that was a three-year degree. I finished that in 1990, and then after that I got accepted to medical school at McGill as well, and that's a four-year program when you go after a bachelor's degree, so I did four years medical school at McGill. That finished, I graduated in 1994, and then I got accepted into the surgery residency training program here at McGill with all the McGill hospitals, and that's when I finished that for five years in 1999. And after that, I did the two or three years of fellowships I told you about in super specializing. So I graduated from surgery in 1999, as you can see, and uh, after that I did extra training, uh, what's called a fellowship which is after you become a specialist, a surgeon, for example, then you do extra years of training to uh, choose a subspecialty, you could say, to become super specialized. And so I did for a few years training in uh, trauma surgery and intensive care medicine and also thoracic surgery. So if you look at what I'm a specialist in, I'm really a specialist of the chest, like lungs, heart, esophagus, all the organs in the chest. And I also do, so I do surgery of that uh, electively, meaning cases that present to me in the clinic, for example, that need surgery electively, and then I also do emergency surgery for trauma cases. And so since about 2003, 2004, I've been a practicing surgeon. I used to be in Toronto for three, four years, and then I came uh, to, to back to Montreal, where I'm from, and for, so I've been working at the Montreal General for about three years now uh, as one of the trauma surgeons. Yeah, for sure. So this is just the first step uh, in a lot of years of training become a general surgeon or any surgeon you have to have a lot of experience and you need technical skills and you need to know what you're doing and why you're doing these things you need to also develop a, a, a clinical sense so uh, when you how to see which patients will need more urgent care um, how to evaluate patients depending on their clinical scenario these are skills that you will only learn with experience and with um, but of course by studying and by reviewing with staff who have had more experience than you so residency program is just you build up on your experiences that you've had during this year and the year after and the year after until you become comfortable dealing with the issues that you're supposed to be dealing with. It's a uh, it's very I don't know how to describe it but it's uh, it's scary because when you're a medical student you you're very confident you know you think you're you've mastered some skills that will you know, allow you to become a good resident, but then you get there and there's so much, you realize that there's so much to learn and there's so little time to learn it that you are basically just running around all the time trying to find the answers to the questions that you're looking at. It's a big switch because when, especially when you're a medical student, you don't have the responsibilities not on you. So although you can suggest uh, things to the resident, it's the resident who has to sign at the end. Uh, so the responsibility at the end lies on the resident, but when you're a medical student, it doesn't. So this burden of responsibility is something that, as medical students, you underestimate a lot. Sure. Um, basically, my advice is make sure that it's what you want to do, because it's not easy. It's not an easy process, but it's a great process for somebody who would be interested in doing it. So if you're enthusiastic about it, you know, um, go shadow people. People are very open to having students see what they're doing. So shadow people, shadow residents, staff, surgeons, um, and you know, take it from there. And if you want, if it's really what you want, don't be discouraged. Uh, it's a long process, but you know, you can always uh, do it. In two things I guess I would say. It's a very, first of all, you have to make sure you like it. So this is a type of career which is a very consuming career it's not the type of job that you do just to pay the bills or just to do a job and expect to do a lot of other things also on the side it's like a vocation so you have to love what you do and because to be good at it you'll have to be dedicated at it and you don't want to be called 
at one in the morning for a case and be very upset that that's what you chose for your life and it's going to affect the rest of your life. So for sure, make sure you love, especially something like surgery, which is, you know, a dermatologist doesn't come back in the hospital at 2 o'clock in the morning and neither does an accountant or anybody. So, but if you become a surgeon, especially if you're a neurosurgeon or a thoracic surgeon or a general surgeon, you'll, you might get called at night for emergency. So you have to accept that and know that that's part of your career. And you have to be ready to deal with life and death situations. So you have to know that one, you know, you're happy, you love what you do, and that you're ready to make tough decisions, do something technical, that standing up for long hours, operating, or making life and death decisions, who to operate on, who not to operate on. We have to be ready to accept that as a life. Not everyone wants that. Some people want more of a routine thing. They go, they punch in, they punch out, nine to five, and they're not responsible for like people's lives. So that's one thing. The second thing is you have to be ready to study a long time before you finish. So you counted the years, so after CJF, three years undergrad, four years medical school, that's seven, five years of general surgery, that's 12. Plus, if you want to do me, what I did, thoracic trauma, you can add two or three more years, so 15 years of university. So this is something to consider before you start. Uh, it's not as daunting as it sounds because it's one step after another. So when I did my three years, I didn't know it was going to be 12 more years. I just, so next step, what do I want to do? Next step, what do I want to do? And so, but you, it is a long process. You will not finish studying when you're 25 and start, you know, having a family and this, you, everything gets delayed a little bit. You have to be ready to study into your 30s. And, uh, but life is great afterwards, very fulfilling job. So it is worth it, I would say, but it's not for everybody. Well, to be honest with you, um, I wouldn't say in the last five years if that's changed. I think since I was a first year resident and even when I was a medical student, the majority of the people that we were seeing in the emergency department were were above the age of 65, so geriatric. So um, that's definitely, it's, it's stayed the same in the sense that it's the majority of the people that we're taking care of. What that really means um, is essentially, you know, you'll have old people who are coming in with chronic medical problems, so lots of medication lists, polypharmacy, so lots of medications being prescribed by different doctors, Patients are taking different medications from different pharmacies, suffering secondary effects of the medications, or you know, getting double of the same medication. So that happens quite a bit. There's lots of people who are um, have dementia, so they can't, um, or uh, advancing dementia, so they can't necessarily go home. Lots of social issues as well. Um, you know, them and their spouse are old. Um, who's going to take care of them? So, you know, a lot of patients are being admitted to the hospital for social reasons because they can't go home, they can't take care of themselves, they can't feed themselves, they're a, a danger to themselves and to others as well. Um, so they'll take up a bed in the hospital for weeks and months until they're waiting for placement elsewhere, outside of the hospital, which can also take a very long time uh, to find nursing homes to shift these patients to. Um, so yeah, I mean, I haven't noticed the change in the last five years, uh, but that's definitely a, a, an overall issue and I think that it's obviously going to become more of an issue as the population ages, uh, absolutely. Um, so I think one of, the thi one of the first things that I would change is probably the emergency department. Um, in Quebec, the emergency departments aren't very, uh, they're very overcrowded, so it's difficult to have privacy of the patients in their individual bed. I, and I think that's one of the things that we have to look into changing in the future. So if I have to choose maybe one thing to change, I think that would be it. So I think uh, two things, that for the two things I'll talk to you about, for the thoracic surgery that I do, the chest surgery electively, like cancer cases and other lung diseases, uh, when I first started, we used to do a lot of our surgeries open, meaning big incisions and opening the patient up and having our hands in there and doing the surgery. And what's changed over the last five to 10 years is a lot of these surgeries can be done minimally invasive. So we do it through small keyhole incisions, like one centimeter incisions, and we put one of the, we put a camera in one of those incisions, and then we instruments through the other two, and then the camera's connected to a TV screen, and basically we can do a lot of the surgeries we used to do open, we can do them sort of like a video game, with the instruments inside and the camera connected to a TV screen, so you're looking at the TV screen while you're operating, and you do the entire surgery, and at the end the patient just has three or four small incisions instead of one big one. That's the main difference that's happened in thoracic surgery. In trauma surgery, Trauma surgery is always big surgery, big incisions. You don't really do it through small incisions because someone is bleeding to death or something really serious. However, the thing that's changed in that is that 
We have a, a very good uh, radiology department now, interventional radiology, so a lot of the things we used to operate on, we now can manage by monitoring them in the intensive care unit. And for example, if someone has a bleeding blood vessel in the liver, normally we would go to the operating room and do something surgically about that. Now there's a lot of cases where we can go to the radiology department and through catheters, through, through arteries and veins, we can embolize or clot those vessels. And so the patient never has to have a surgery and they just, we close that bleeder, we monitor them in the intensive care unit and then they end up, you know, doing okay, hopefully, without any surgery. So there's more and more of that. So I would say those are the two main things that have changed in the last five to ten years. Um, with regards to the last five years, I think what's really neat is that the technology has been much uh, more, I've seen it much more prevalent, especially in the emergency department. Before, uh, let's say at the beginning of my residency, uh, when we had patients come in, they would take long magnetic strips and write their names on the magnetic strips, and they would write, the nurses would write the diagnosis, would write the patient's age, and put it on the board. And then say, bed number one. And the bed number two was a second patient. If the patient was about ready to leave, they just move the, the magnetic strip over a little bit so we know that this bed is being liberated, we can bring in another patient soon. Now, We've got TV screens all over the emergency department. We've got computers as well that are connected to those computer screens. Um, everything is computerized. So looking at the screen, I can tell how many patients are in the emergency department right now. Um, I can tell the ages, their names, where they are. Um, depending on the color scheme, I can also tell if they've been seen yet or waiting to be seen. The percentage of, of time, the, the amount of time that they've been waiting there. So some people, they're supposed to be seen immediately. Uh, or some people need to be seen within 15 minutes, depending on their triage category. And I, if they're at like 150%, that means that they've waited, you know, 150% uh, of the time that they should have waited. So I know that this patient needs to be seen sooner rather than later. Patients that have been discharged, um, you know, they appear in a different color. Uh, patients who um, are out of the emergency department because they went for an x-ray or a different color. So all of this information, just looking at one computer screen, one TV screen that's in uh, that's that's up in the emergency department, whereas before we used to use magnetic strips, it's so much easier. Um, again, computer application as well. Um, before, when uh, we need to write orders for medications for patients, I have to take out a piece of paper, write the order. It was a carbon copy. I'd have to, you know, tell the nurse or give the the chart to the nurse or flag the paper so I would just keep the paper out of the chart and put the chart back on the rack. And then when the, patient, when the nurse was walking past or looked at the chart, she'd grab the chart, she'd look at it, she'd write the order. Now, on the computer screen, I find the patient's name, I click on it, I write the medication name, done. On the nurse's screen, it appears there's a new order and she processes it. It's that fast. No paper. And this is just, this is, I think this is just the last two years they've incorporated this program in. Um, so that's amazing. The other thing that's awesome is, um, is, um, um, we have all these calculators and apps on our phones, on iPhones. Everybody has iPhones. Um, and so if I want to do some type of a specific calculation of, um, let's say somebody comes in and I think maybe they have a pulmonary embolism, like a clot in their lungs. There's actually a calculator you can use that says, you know, if this patient has five of these criteria, the risk of having a pulmonary embolism are high. But if I can't necessarily remember all the criteria, I can open up this app. And it's basically a checklist. And so I can say yes, 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 yes. And then it comes up. If you click yes to all of these, this patient has a high risk of a pulmonary embolism. So just having it on my Palm Pilot, on my, um, on my iPhone, right? Like I, before I used to look, have to look on the computer, go to Google, do this. But at the bedside, just pull out my phone and just put it in. Um, so that makes my decision process much faster as well. Um, medication doses. Sometimes I can't remember. I have an app. I just look it up and say, okay, I'll let the nurse know you know what, we're gonna give this patient this many milligrams of this medication because this is the dose you're supposed to give the patient. Whereas before I'd have to go look it up, physically look it up, and now I have an app that has all the medication doses.